Okay, welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, this talk is Diagnosing Issues in JavaScript, Windows Store Apps with Visual Studio. This talk is going to be primarily focused on diagnosing issues in Windows Store Apps, as the title says. There is a parallel talk going on right now focusing on the F12 developer tools that ship in Internet Explorer 11. So if you have a strong interest in Internet Explorer, if you're not doing web or Windows Store development, I just want to make you aware that you know, the talk is going on as well right now. Uh, it's a little bright, so if you have a question, I love questions throughout. Please wave vigorously. I have a little bit of a hard time seeing people. So my name is Andrew Hall. I'm a program manager in the Visual Studio Diagnostics team. We own the debugger and the profiling tools. Uh, we build a lot of those in conjunction with other teams, especially when you're dealing with something like JavaScript that runs on a JavaScript runtime. Uh, there, everything's done in partnership with the runtime itself. And then there's also some teams that work on the pieces that ship in the F12 experience in Internet Explorer that we work closely with to bring those pieces into Visual Studio. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you today is going to be focused on the Windows Store experience, but it works in most cases against Internet Explorer as well. So just to set the agenda, I'm going to hit on some new features that we've added in Visual Studio 2013. Uh, since this is a debugging talk, I'm going to recap some useful functionality that I think is just good debugging know-how. Uh, one of the things, when I showed up at Microsoft and started working on the debugging team, I'd been using Visual Studio for years, and I found all this functionality in the debugger. I was like, oh, if I had just known about that feature, it would have saved me hours and hours before I showed up. So apologies if you're a debugging expert, but hopefully you'll learn something new, even if it's a bit of a recap. And then I want to talk about our new performance and diagnostics hub. Uh, you saw it in the keynote yesterday. Um, it, a new single point of entry for all performance tools. We want to continue to bring diagnostics tools into what we're calling performance on diagnostics hub so that you don't have to go searching and know things are there. Discoverability is solved for you. And we think it has a better experience than some of the things we had before as well. So the new debugging features I'm going to hit on is async debugging. We saw that in the keynote yesterday. So async debugging, if you've ever debugged promises or any asynchronous operations in JavaScript before, you know that your call stack can be a pain. Like, I have no idea how I got here when I break. So we've improved that. Um, maybe you kicked off an asynchronous operation and you have no idea if it's completed. We help with that. Uh, JavaScript attach, you can finally attach to JavaScript. No more relaunching your application when you have a problem. Uh, and some improvements to the console and DOM Explorer windows and then JavaScript C++ interop. Uh, we've enabled the ability to, without using two copies of Visual Studio against the same process, to debug JavaScript and C++ at the same time. Um, before I get started, how many people here are developing Windows Store applications? Fair number of people. How many people here do primarily web development in Internet Explorer? OK, not that many. So it looks like we have mostly people developing store apps. Uh, some of the features that I think are worth reviewing um, just to talk about, make sure you're aware of. Some of them have been in for a while. Some of them have been added more recently. Our first chance exceptions, uh, this is the debugger will break when an exception is thrown, regardless of whether you're going to handle it or not. Uh, trace points and conditional breakpoints, a feature called code map that I'll show you a little bit, um, pinning data tips, how you can keep them around in your editor. Uh, and how to debug suspend and resume in Windows Store applications, and then how to debug background tasks and contracts in Windows Store applications. Uh, code paths that you can't necessarily invoke via normal use of the application. So first thing I want to talk about is the new async debugging functionality that we've added in Visual Studio. And async debugging aims to answer the questions, why am I here and what is going on right now? And how have we done that? is we've enhanced the call stack window and the tasks window. How many people here have done uh, any task-based programming in Visual Studio before, either in C Sharp or C++? OK, a couple people. So this was the window that was formerly called the parallel tasks window. Did you make use of that in your development? I see some head nods. So it's been renamed tasks. It's not called parallel tasks anymore in the 2013 preview. And then you can see in the call stack, and we'll look at this here in a minute, but we've added the ability, you see this gray frame, oh, wrong mouse, 
right here that says async call. So we show you the logical call stack for your application when you're in asynchronous operation, even though the reality of it is your call stack only really starts here from a thread perspective. And then in the task window, we show you tasks that are in flight, and then you can see tasks that have completed, and you can see whether they've completed in success or in error. So it supports Windows Store, web, and desktop applications, all the async debugging features. You don't have to be doing Windows Store apps specifically. You can be targeting an IE. You can build a desktop application. The only caveat to that is it does require Windows 8.1 uh, because Windows did some work for us in the operating system to enable this capability. So that's one of the cool new debugging things that really lights up on Windows 8.1. So let's go ahead and take a look at async debugging and JavaScript attach real quick. I'll switch over. So I have a really simple application here. And what it, oops, sorry, that's not what, what it's going to do is, or what I want it to do, is it's going to enumerate the folders and files in my pictures folder. So I just have one folder with a couple pictures in it and one thing. And so I'm going to press F5 to launch my application. That's actually by design, but uh, sorry, I wanted to. Sorry. What I wanted to do first was this. Sorry. I apologize. All right. So, sorry, that was by design. But. So I launched my app, and nothing happens. And so I mentioned I wanted to review some useful features that we'd talked you know, have shipped for many, many years in Visual Studio. And this is one that when I showed up, when I learned about it, I was like, oh, this would have saved me so much time. So I'm expecting a list of folders here that have pictures and nothing's happening. And you notice my application didn't crash, right? So what's going on? So if we go ahead back to Visual Studio, and you saw it's already did already, but I'm on the debug menu, I'm going to go to exceptions. And for my JavaScript exceptions, I'm going to say, I want you to break when thrown. So even if, so, if something's going wrong and there's an error handler that's handling it, maybe it's probably resulting in some behavior that I may or may not want. So in general, it's a really good idea to debug with first chance exceptions on. So I'm going to hit F5 again. And as you just saw a minute ago, I apologize about that. It's going to tell me that an exception was thrown at line 53. And if I click break, it's going to take me right there. So in, I'm now in my asynchronous code. You can see I'm kind of in the bowels of this uh, get local folders async. That's where I'm enumerating my folders. Then I'm doing a storage file get async. And in here it's crashing. And it gave me an error message that folders of i is undefined. So if I look at i, it's going to tell me that i is 2. What am I doing wrong here? And if I look at folders.length, I can see folders has a length of 2 as well. So the problem is, is that I've done this inside a for loop which for those of you that are regular JavaScript developers, you know that that's not going to work for something like this. What I really needed to do is I needed to do this inside a for each. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly replace that with a function that now uses for each functionality. And so I, you can see I replaced where I was doing a, a for loop. For each, and let's go ahead and press F5. Sorry, that was not. I apologize in advance. We had some uh, some major display issues getting things uh, set up here, and um, it did not work correctly. for a second. And everything works as expected. So first chance exceptions helped me debug a silent failure. It wasn't a crash. It just worked. So one of the other things that I mentioned that we have, have done is the concept of tasks. So when I have a failure that occurs, the question is, how can I know what's in flight and what isn't? So if I hit F9, so I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint on this line, and I hit F5, 
So now in the tasks window, which is appearing right down here, I'll bring it up here and go ahead and make it big for the purposes of this. I now have a list of all of my tasks that are in flight. So this is the one of the async debugging enhancements that we've done. And I can see what's active and I can see what's completed. So for example, my windows.storage.git file from path async, I can see appears in the task list and it completed successfully. If it had completed an error, then it would have a big red square right there. So the other great thing that we've done is, as I showed earlier in the screenshot, is this concept of the async call stack. So when you break somewhere in code that you may or may not know where it is, for example, I'm down here inside the bowels of a several chain dot thens in my call stack window, I can see the async call, I can see async call, and so I can walk back up my call stack. Now, it, it'll take me to the line of code where the call occurred from, but because it's not actually executing, you don't have any debug context there, so you can't inspect variables for anything that's below an async call in your stack, because that's you know, logical stitching that we're doing. There's no ex execution context to inspect execution context to inspect at that time. So any questions so far on that? Nope. Okay. So the other thing that I wanted to show is I wanted to show that we fully support attach now. So I'm gonna go ahead and say let's take the breakpoint off here. Debug. Start without debugging. Comes up. Go back to Visual Studio, say debug, attach to process. I'm going to go ahead and, oh, awesome. It does not like this display resolution. <laughs> so now I am debugging. And if I come back here and set a breakpoint, hopefully it got the right thing when I was. And I hit a breakpoint in my JavaScript. For anybody that's ever, has anybody dealt with the fact that you had to relaunch your JavaScript applications before to dealt with that pain point? So just to prove that it's not tied just to Visual Studio, I'm going to go ahead and attach to IE. So let's do iExplore. I want to go ahead and pick script code in this case. Hit OK, and as soon as I do something, oh, so I need to click break. And now it'll break the next time JavaScript code runs. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> I chose the wrong process. Thank you. By the way, we plan to fix that experience for you so you don't have to deal with this anymore. So it should be, let's see what let's just do. Now let's click break. And there we go. We're at, we've hit a break point in Internet Explorer. So Visual Studio applies equally as well. Thank you. I appreciate the, the assistance on that one. So we talked about async debugging. We talked about JavaScript attach, first chance exceptions. Oh, and the one other thing that I wanted to show is I wanted to show the concept of trace points. Does anybody in here know what a trace point is in Visual Studio? OK, only one person raised their hand. So awesome. So a trace point is a breakpoint that allows you to do something and then continue execution. So in the case of this particular um, scenario, I'm going to go ahead and say I want to get pictures from web. It's another method that I'm going to call. And I'm going to go ahead and hit F5. Should at some point. Yep, okay, perfect. So my call did not succeed, and I put a, a debugger keyword in to the error handler for when the call did not succeed. So I said I always want to break if the web folder can't be found. So it turns out that the reason it can't be found is I don't have a network, valid network connection that I've pointed to here. So it's something that I want to make sure I resolve before I, in the future, but it's not something I want to deal with, deal with now. So instead of changing my code, because I think that's a valid thing to have there, I'm going to insert a breakpoint here, and I'm going to say, when hit, and I'm going to go ahead and say, print a message and continue execution. So this is, and I'm just going to say, you know, no network connection. Let's go ahead and say, okay. 
So now, instead of breaking at the debugger keyword, it's going to hit this breakpoint, it's going to output a message to my output window, and execution is just going to continue. So now, if I say debug, windows, output, and I can see that my mess, sorry, that font's really small, but it says no network connection, so it printed the message that I had in my output window. So that's just another little tool that you can think about using in the arsenal. I know most, most of you are probably familiar with console.log in JavaScript. Yes? So people are saying yes. Um, but this is a way that you can do that without having to actually modify your source code. It's just native support baked into the Visual Studio debugger for um, outputting messages like that and tracing an application. So it can also be used like I just did it to override the debugger keyword. So we just talked about first chance exceptions and trace points. Um, you don't need me to really dig into that too much. So the DOM Explorer, there's a whole list of improvements. Uh, there's a couple talks that have talked about this, so I just picked a couple of the highlights that I thought would be interesting here. Um, as I mentioned, there's the IE talk going on right now. I have a link to that session in at the end of the deck if you want to go download and watch it. But one of the couple great things that I think have been added to the DOM Explorer is IntelliSense now for CSS properties. You can applaud for that one. That one's pretty nice instead of trying to remember what all the CSS properties are. Uh, drag and drop, if you want to rearrange things and see what it would look like if you changed your HTML, you can just drag and drop. And you can edit things as HTML in the DOM Explorer window now. So, uh, JavaScript console improvements. How many people in here use the JavaScript console during development? So, again, there's a whole list of improvements. Um, I've just listed a couple here, but they've added support for console.group, console.time, so you can measure how long things take. You can do a start and begin and end. Um, you can see up at the top, there's support for filtering and clearing, so you can filter between warnings and errors and messages, and you can also clear the window if you're tired of looking at all the stuff you've just typed in there. There's IntelliSense for global variables right now. Um, team is looking at how they can get IntelliSense for local, but if you want to do document.getElementById, it will, IntelliSense will help you with that. And so you can then use the autocomplete functionality as well. So for those of you doing um, Windows Store application development, how many people are writing pure JavaScript and how many people are using uh, some other library in either C Sharp or C++? How many people are using, using some other library language? Okay, a fair number of people. Are people doing C++ or C Sharp? C++. How many people are doing C Sharp? Oh, almost everybody. How many people are doing C++? Oh, a lot, of, a lot of mixed stuff. So how many people have a pain debugging both of them at the same time? <laughs> Smiles. So in preview, we have added support to do JavaScript and C++ at the same time while you're debugging. Um, so you can break in either C++ or in JavaScript at a breakpoint. Uh, when an exception occurs, first chance exceptions work, just like I just demoed. Um, and then if you press the break icon in Visual Studio, the next time something executes, that'll break. You can inspect locals, the call stack, et cetera. Uh, we'll look at this in just a minute. But if you look at the language um, up there in the call stack, you can see the top one is C++. You have a call to external code. That's across my application boundary. And then further down on the stack is JavaScript code for my data.js that we were just looking at. So, and how you enable this is you go into the project properties. For those of you that are already debugging these, I'm sure you know how to do it, but you, we've added another option that says script with native in the project properties. The reason it's titled script with native, there's a couple caveats um, to the way it works today. You can't step in the JavaScript experience. You can hit breakpoints and you can use the watch windows, but data tips don't work and stepping doesn't work in JavaScript. So it really is a script or a native with script kind of experience. It's not truly just debugging both at the same time. But we think it's a lot better than what you had before. Does everybody know the two, two IDE trick is what we shipped in Visual Studio 2012? No? Some head shakes? So what I'm talking about is in Visual Studio 2012, and you'll still need to do this with Manage, you can open a Windows Store application that's set to debug with JavaScript, press F5 to start debugging, and then you can take, open a second instance of Visual Studio and attach with the managed or native debug engine, and now you're debugging both at the same time. So 
That's a little trick for you, for those of you that need to do it. I, most people raise their hand that they were doing C Sharp. It's not amazing, but it's a lot better than like, oops, nope, problem wasn't in JavaScript. Stop debugging, go change the engine type, start debugging again, see if I can find it in managed or native. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of things we just talked about. The DOM Explorer, C++ Interop, and the JavaScript console improvements. So first thing I want to do is uh, show the DOM Explorer. So we got our application up and working. Uh, we fixed the bug where you know, we weren't seeing anything. And now I want to just go look at my pictures folder. And I want to see what I want is I want this image to show up. And I want to be able to do things with it as my ultimate goal. So I have a button up here that says antique. I'd like to add some functionality that lets me edit my photos. But to start, I'm not super happy with how much dead space is between the photo here and the top up there. So I want to see if I can figure out using the DOM Explorer how to, how to improve that. So debug. We'll make this full screen, and we're going to take advantage of the awesome new functionality in, oh, that doesn't work. Sad. Sorry. I, um, so where did my DOM Explorer go? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pull this in over here. And when I click on this, um, I can go ahead and do this. And now I can hover over and it'll select things for me in the DOM Explorer automatically. So I've gone ahead and selected my header. So I'm going to go ahead back to full screen mode uh, just so you can see what I'm doing over here. And what I want to do is I'm going to see that, well, that's a really, 180 pixels a really big space for my header. So I'm going to go ahead and here and I can just type and you'll see IntelliSense pop up for me. So ms-grid dash rows, and so I don't have to remember anymore. Now it just automatically tabs over, and let's see what it looks like if I do 75px. And so that looks a lot better. So I'm going to go ahead and make a note that I want to reduce the size of my header file, um, and I can go ahead and fix, fix that later. You don't need to see me go fi fix it in code right now. So the next thing I want to do is now that we have it working, is I've gone ahead and created a, have some more pictures that I'd like to add to my picture folder. So I'm going to go ahead and copy these, and I'm going to add them into my regular pictures folder. So let's go ahead and paste those in. And while they're pasting in, go ahead and open Visual Studio, and I'm going to press F5. And how many people have seen this dialog before? Right? It's telling me an unhandled Win32 exception occurred in www.host.exe. So at this point, I have the option to go attach with the native debugger or re-debug it with native. So let's go ahead in this case, and let's go ahead to my project properties. And let's go to debugging. And let's pick what I just talked about, the native with script option. Oh, this is going to, sorry. Sorry, I'm going to have to make this a little bigger so I can actually. Everybody still see that? Okay. Script only. So let's change this to native with script. Let's go ahead and press F5. And I can see that I've now broken in my C++ code. But if I go back to my call stack window, you can see that I indeed do still have JavaScript code on my call stack window. So if I double click here, it takes me to where I've called the sample image property on the C++ object in JavaScript. So going back to my source file, was there a question? Or... Yes? I'm sorry, what was the question? So the question was, can you inspect variables in JavaScript when breaking this way? The answer is kind of. So if I go back to my call stack window, and I go back to my JavaScript function, 
you can see that my um, locals window will work. So in this case, folder is one of my JavaScript objects, and so I can inspect it in the folder. Uh, what will not work is things like the DOM Explorer and the console window. So you, you can use the watch windows, but it, basically expression evaluation doesn't work, which means that if you type in something, um, which the console window is all expression evaluation, we don't, that can't be executed in the context of JavaScript because the JavaScript engine is actually broken by the native debugger. It's not running at, at that point in time. So go ahead back to my call stack window. So I can see up here in, the fo in this that what I've done is it's, I'm getting divide by zero exception. And if I expand this, I can see that my image list has a size of zero. And it's the folder is the nine months folder. So if I go look, look at nine months, it's empty. I forgot to account for the fact that, well, what if a folder's empty when I was doing my math? So that's an exception. Um, it's something I should deal with. I can work around it right now. So the next thing I want to show, this is another uh, refresh, um, sort of a, something to be aware of that we shipped in Visual Studio in previous versions. But it's called CodeMap. Has anybody seen CodeMap before? So this was added to Visual Studio Ultimate in update number one uh, to Visual Studio 2012. And so what it does is, go ahead and let me make that uh, full screen. Let me bring it over here. But by default, it lives next to your editor um, here. And so I'll go ahead and, and do this real quick just to view full screen. And then I can zoom in. And it's a map of my code. So I can click, and as I execute around, it's a graphical representation of the call stack. So here, what I want to do now is I'm going to go ahead, and I can insert comments as I go. So I'm going to say new comment, and I want to say handle empty folder. So that's a note that I've made for myself. And I have the option on up here on share to, I can save it as an image. I can actually save it as a file. I'm just going to go ahead and save it now. That's going to be a reminder to me to come back and in my code handle the empty folder thing. I can go ahead and close that now. And I'm going to work around for the purposes of our demo right now. I'm going to fix the bug the good old fashioned way. And let's go ahead and just delete the empty folder. Don't you wish you could fix all your bugs by just getting rid of the bad data? It, software, would be, software would always work if you didn't have users, right? Yes. The question was, is the feature still available only in Ultimate? And yes, that, the feature is available only in Ultimate. I'm sorry, it's the only feature that I'm showing today that is an Ultimate only feature. So, but for those of you that do have Ultimate, and you can get Ultimate in the preview to download and play with, it's kind of a cool feature. As you step around, it'll, in the debugger, it'll continue to build a record of where you step, so you can then see a graphical representation of what your debugging looked like. So. Anybody, uh, any more questions? All right, so now that we, let's hit F5. Let's make sure that that's working. And I'm going to see a lot more pictures come in. So let's make sure that everything's working as I would expect. And immediately I can see that something's not quite right here. Um, notice that all the little thumbnails up here are actually the same. So do I have another bug? I'm not quite sure what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and come back to Visual Studio. And one thing I want to do is I'm going to do a console.log onto my um, thing so you can see the new console.group functionality. So let's go ahead and add a console.group. So let's say console.group. And we have this group collapse functionality as well. So the difference between group and group collapsed is group will stick it into the console window expanded. Group collapse will leave it open. And let's call it um, folder. And then I need to end my group right here. It should be dot done. And it should say function. So that should do the trick. So I just want to make sure that I'm actually logging everything that I expect to. 
So when I come back to my JavaScript console window, oh, so we just got bit by the bug that I, or the behavior that I was telling you about, that those windows don't work when you're native with script. So we have to go back to script only. I apologize. I'm guessing that most of you will, uh, will hit that in the future. We will do our best to address it. And so I'm going to go ahead and go to the JavaScript console window. And you can see that the add pictures have been added up here. Sorry, that's really, really small. Um, and when I do this, I can see that all the pictures that I expect to are appearing. So let's say, you know, so I can go dig through this list, and I, I will indeed see that, uh, that all of those pictures have been added. So what do I want to do, do next? Um, JavaScript console, just show that you can do this. IntelliSense. Working, autocomplete, get element by ID, I can enter an element, and I can go. So next functionality that I want to talk about in the IDE, that this is again some refresh functionality, but is the concept of conditional breakpoints. So everybody from, how many people here know about conditional breakpoints in the IDE? Okay, about half the people. So for those of you that don't, uh, what I want to do is I want to make sure that the picture, picture's really getting added. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm creating an object URL based on the image file. So I want to compare those notes. So let's go back and pick an image that doesn't look right. So this image underscore 4002.jpg uh, doesn't look like what's, what's showing here isn't matching what's showing there. So I'm going to go ahead and right click on it and then I can choose condition. And I want to say break when, one second, sorry. It's going to be um, file.name image underscore 4002.jpg. So you, any expression that you can type in the console window, you can use here as a conditional breakpoint. So hopefully I typed that correctly. Let's go back. When I click back, and it's going to break. Notice we added a bunch of stuff, and we hit here once we got to that, the breakpoint when the value is this. So if we look at file, we can see that name is indeed 4002. So what I want to do now is I want to, from the data tip of uh, file, I want to make sure that when I'm creating this image URL, I'm actually creating a unique image URL. So I'm going to use another piece of functionality in the IDE uh, to pin the data tip to my source editor. How many people knew that you could do that? Okay, about half the people knew that you could do that. So now the thing about this is that I don't like right now is that, well, every next time I hit a breakpoint, the value is going to go away. So how do I do that? So I want to make sure that I get the same value as before. So I'm going to go ahead and use this comment field down here, and I'm going to say last value. So I want to make sure I'm creating something different the next time that I hit a breakpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and slide this up a row. I can get it out of the way up there. I'm going to go ahead and remove my condition because I just want to break the next time I hit the next breakpoint. And when I come back, I can indeed see that this value is different than the value that I had last time using the ability to pin the data tips and the ability to use conditional breakpoints to hit when I know that I have a problem. So my next thought, this is actually a problem that I really hit when I was playing around with developing this app, is, all right, so it seems that I'm creating everything correctly with the debugger is this maybe a problem that I'm having with the memory of my application. So one of the things I want to do is I wanted to go hit on the memory tool in Visual Studio. Um, how many people have seen the memory tool that we shipped in Visual Studio update number one? OK, only a couple people. Awesome. So uh, just a reminder, we talked about DOM Explorer, the JavaScript C++ interop debugging, JavaScript console improvements, uh, code map functionality, and the ability to pin data tips. Question? So the question was, are console.group only available for 8.1 apps? No, those should work if you're developing a Windows 8 app inside 2012. Um, there, although the caveat to that, though, is I believe I'm going to say this with 80% certainty, that you need to be running on the 8.1, even if you want to target 8.0. I think 
that currently the preview build won't actually let you target Windows 8 running on Windows 8. It's kind of a, any other questions? All right, so we talked about code map. All right, so memory tool. Before I get there, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm talking talk about the performance and diagnostics hub that we shipped in Visual Studio. So the idea is, now how many people here use Visual Studio 2012? All right, everybody raise their hand. How many people have had something that would have had been interesting to use a memory tool to solve in Visual Studio 2012? How many people knew that the memory tool was in Visual Studio 2012? All right, so a lot of people that raised their hand that said that they wished they had had a memory tool in Visual Studio 2012 um, didn't raise their hand when they said that they had used it. And I'm just curious, when you said you didn't use it, did you not know it was there? Oh, that, that's fine, that's fine. So one of the things we, right, because it's on this weird flyout menu under debug, it says JavaScript analysis, and then you can get to the memory tool that way. And this is a problem for all the tools that we ship. So we have decided we want a single point of entry that you can find any performance tool that you would ever want for your application type. And so the JavaScript analysis thing showed up on the C sharp, you know, showed up on the debug menu always. So we had people who are C sharp developers saying, hey, I have a C sharp application open. Why do I have this JavaScript thing showing up on my debug menu? So our answer to that is the Performance and Diagnostics Hub. In your preview build that is shipped today, there are the following tools in there. Uh, you have JavaScript memory that I mentioned. There was a version of it shipped for Visual Studio 2012 in update one. Uh, JavaScript function timing, this is the JavaScript profiler. Does anybody use the JavaScript profiler in 2012 or in Internet Explorer? So it was debug start performance analysis in Visual Studio 2012. It's obviously under the F12 tools in Internet Explorer. Um, the HTML UI responsiveness profiler, this was shipped in Visual Studio 2012 update number two. How many people have seen that tool? Nobody raised their hand, awesome. So we will briefly look at that tool then. And there's a great talk that's being done by Jonathan Carter tomorrow morning um, where he's actually gonna deep dive on the memory and the UI responsiveness tools. So I'll briefly just show them to you today. But if you really wanna dig into those tools, you can go check out his session. And again, I have a link to that at the end of the deck. Um, the energy profiler that was shown in the keynote yesterday, how many people like that? I had a lot of people stop by the Visual Studio booth and ask about that after that keynote. So that's brand new. And then uh, Visual Studio CPU profiling, this is for managed and native references only. At the moment, we don't show JavaScript code in that. And then I mentioned it here just for the sake of completeness, there is a XAML UI responsiveness that would be the equivalent of the HTML UI responsiveness that is also shipping, but obviously it only applies to C++ or .NET XAML applications. So the way you get to this is debug performance and diagnostics, and that's gonna bring you to this great new launch page that we have. And it's gonna list all these tools. It's gonna to pick your project for you. You have additional options um, that I'll walk you through, but you can attach to a running application. You can choose an installed application if you're on a machine where you've deployed it maybe remotely, and you have Visual Studio, but you don't have the project for some reason. So briefly, we'll walk through the tools. Uh, JavaScript memory, goal is to identify unintentionally retained and inefficient use of memory and it's gonna show you your JavaScript, your DOM elements, and your WinRT objects. We'll show you references that you're holding to WinRT objects, uh, but it doesn't know how big your WinRT objects are, so that's left as a little bit of an exercise for you. Um, let's go ahead and briefly switch over and look at those two tools. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop debugging. I'm gonna go to debug, performance and diagnostics, and any tool that you ever wanna find, you should be able to find right here. So it's automatically picked my startup project for me, which is my photo editor. And I can choose CPU sampling, all the tools I just mentioned. We'll go ahead and choose JavaScript memory. And the long-term vision is that we would let you combine multiple tools at the same time. That's why there's a checkbox interface on here. Even though at the moment in preview, uh, tools can't work together. There's some additional work that needs to be done. And then as I was mentioning, you can click on this change target up here. And so I can use my startup project, which is what has automatically been selected for me, or I can attach to a running app, I can pick an installed application, or if I'm doing non-store app development, I may want to target an executable or an ASP.NET application running on my uh, local host. But for the purposes of this, our startup project's fine. So let's go ahead and click Start. Set my elevation prompt. 
And so I'm going to go ahead here, and I'm going to let's go take a snapshot and see what's going on. And instantly, I noticed when I first did this uh, that it's telling me that my memory is about 445 megabytes. Given that I'm not doing that much, that seems a little strange, and so I wonder if that's a problem. I could take an additional snapshot after something had changed and compare those. Uh, Jonathan will walk you through that tomorrow. But right now, I'm just curious why I'm using over 400 megabytes of memory for that much UI. <laughs> that seems like it may be responsible for some of the weirdness that I'm seeing. So uh, instantly, I'm in the view that's called the dominator's view. Uh, it's showing me the biggest individual instances of objects, and it's sorted by the a column called retain size. Retain size is your size plus anybody else that you're preventing from being garbage collected by the JavaScript runtime. So as you would expect, global is my entire, this maps to what my retain size was on the front size because global holds everything alive. So that's not interesting to me at this point. But as I go down, I can see right away that I have a bunch of 68 megabyte images appearing in here. And so I'm kind of wondering what's going on, and that they're all part of this win template disposable item thing. So turns out, if I do a little bit of investigation into my, into my code, where am I getting all these big images, I am actually not, um, when I'm retrieving them and pushing them into this list for each folder, I'm not using thumbnails. I'm grabbing the full-size image, which was taken on a really nice Canon camera. So it's like 60 megabytes of graphics image per image that I'm displaying. So the question is, can I do better than that? And I believe that I can. So I'm going to go ahead and fix that. Bye. So what I'm going to do now is when I grab each one, I'm going to go ahead and get the thumbnail asynchronously and then I'm going to add the thumbnail to my list. So let's go ahead and press, um, let's go ahead and launch with the memory tool again. Never hurts to have memory monitoring while we're going. And so I can see now that I actually have the behavior that I expect. The image over here matches the image that I have that I would expect to see, as opposed to seeing weird behavior resulting from my various um, problems. So any questions so far on that? Yes? Yes, the question was, the memory is still showing 400 megabytes, and so there's still a problem. Absolutely. There's actually multiple memory problems in this application. Um, I went ahead and fixed one by getting some of the thumb thumbnails, async thumbnails instead of the full images. I would definitely need to um, continue to investigate my memory, and we'll actually get to a little bit of that. I'm going to show you a different problem that results from some of the problems. Yeah. Yep. So the question was, is there a way to compress the photos in the JavaScript code itself? Um, not really, I think, depending on what you mean. But what this actually shows you is it shows you the size of the memory that it's taking up, the graphics memory that it's occupying. So it's not 100% just what you're occupying in RAM, but it's also like once it's blown up in memory, it's ultimately right a full pixel, like 32 bits per Pixel, so. Yes? Is there a way to compare files a running app? Like, if you tap the Internet Explorer and say, it's going weird at this point, start profiling from here. So the question was, can you attach to a running app? And then you specifically asked about Internet Explorer. Yeah, not the store app, Internet Explorer. So the short answer is, you can attach to running apps. In pr the preview version of Visual Studio, we don't allow you to attach to Internet Explorer at this point. Um, honestly, that was an experiential reason, not a technical limitation. Just like I accidentally, at the beginning of my demo, attached to the wrong IE when I was trying to debug it. We've got a lot of complaints about that thing, so we didn't enable that. We would like to get that fixed. 
But these exact same tools ship in F12 in Internet Explorer 11. So you can use the same tools that I'm using here in Internet Explorer against your running websites on the preview build of Windows 8.1 and IE 11. Yes? Yes, so the question was, is there any way to, to dive into the reference and see what's holding it? So absolutely. Um, sorry, I did not show that, but if I click on this here down on the bottom, um, can you see that this is my referenced objects? And so this shows me the reference graph of what's retaining it, holding it alive. So are there any additional questions? All right. So Uh, so this is the JavaScript function timing profiler. This shows you exactly how long every method takes to execute and records exact calls, how many times everything was called, so you can really dig in very, very deep. Um, however, it only shows your JavaScript execution time. This is something that was shipped in Visual Studio 2012 RTM. I'm not going to demo it today. Um, I did give a talk on it at Build last year, uh, last fall. So if you want, and we have a blog post um, walking through using this on our blog that I have again linked to at the end of this. So, um, so next that brings us to the H. Sorry, question. So this tells you how long the function takes to execute. So for asynchronous things, it won't capture the time that you're spent not executing on the. Thread. It will know how long you spent in that RT component. Yes, I actually will. So the question was, can you give an example of another subsystem? Let me step to the next slide because I'll get to that with the UI responsiveness tool. Um, and so they'll talk about all the things that this. This shows all the things that aren't shown by that. So we show you exactly how long your JavaScript takes to execute with that one. We don't have anything, right, like how long are you spending doing layout? How long are you, how much time is being spent because you're doing GCs? Or when I change a property and it, then I draw something and I draw something again, am I wasting CPU cycles doing overdrawing? So that's what I mean. It really only tells you how long your JavaScript takes to execute, but if, for example, you use JavaScript to manipulate CSS properties, like if you ever have tried to do animations with uh, changing like the top and left properties, your JavaScript execute can actually execute pretty fast, but the animation generally won't be that good, and that's because you're spending most of your time uh, doing the layout. Um, so that's why we introduced the HTML UI responsiveness tool. In again, this was Visual Studio update number two to 2012. It does have some improvements in 2000 in 13. Um, this is available from the Performance and Diagnostics Hub as well, and this does a lot more detailed breakdown of, of those specific things that I was talking about. So I said I would briefly show that since no one here had said that they had used it. Um, so there's another opportunity, and this is why I still had a major memory problem. You were right, but I didn't want to fix it yet because it shows really well in this example. So I'm going to go back to my Performance and Diagnostics. I'm going to pick the HTML UI responsiveness. I'm going to click Start. So that's not loading quite as quickly as I would like, so I'm curious if there's anything I can do to make it better. And you can see right away that I have the CPU chart. Notice my CPU chart goes above 200%. Uh, the reason that is is every core represents 100%, so this is a quad-core machine. In theory, that chart could go up to 400%. Um, so you can see I'm actually using over three cores, but I have a lot of blue. So I can zoom in here if I'm interested. And then down here, I get a layout and time of exactly what is occurring. Um, I can see when I, a GC occurs. I can see if I, for example, zoom in here, instead of sorting by start time, I can sort by the operations that are taking the longest. And I can see that I'm using a bunch of CPU doing image decoding. And then you can also see on this CPU chart here that I'm actually using almost an entire core while I'm loading these things, trying to do garbage collections because I'm putting so much pressure on my memory. And so this is where I would go back and use the memory tool again to, to try to fix those additional problems. And just like I wasn't getting the thumbnails for all the individual images when I navigated to the second page, these problems are actually resulting from the fact that I'm 
every one of those tiles on the application that pops up, I'm not retrieving the thumbnail for that either. The fix I made a minute ago was just to get the thumbnails for, for the sub pictures once I navigate. And so these are all still retrieving the full fidelity images. And so you can see from the UI responsiveness tool that if I were to get the thumbnails, I'd probably be spending a lot less time doing image scaling, these big spikes in the CPU. And because I'd be putting a lot less pressure on the memory, then I'd also be wasting a lot less CPU doing garbage collections. So it then shows you if you dig into further things, I don't have a problem in this particular case, but if I clear selection and I sort by my start time, I can see when things occur like HTML parsing, when it speculatively downloads things. Does everybody know what speculative downloading is? Speculative downloading is Internet Explorer and Windows web applications um, just run on the Internet Explorer engine. When it parses the HTML, if it finds any resources referenced, it just automatically goes off and tries to download those ahead of time, even before they're necessarily requested. So that's what speculative downloading is. Again, Jonathan Carter will do a great job of digging in on these tools tomorrow morning, if you're interested, at 9 a.m. So HTML UI responsiveness. CPU sampling. Does anybody use the CPU sampling profiler in Visual Studio? Only one person raising their hand. So again, it's available from the performance and diagnostics page. Uh, this is shipped for quite a while, um, but it will show you the functions that are using the most CPU in your .NET or C Sharp code. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have a unified story for profiling across C++, manage, or .NET, or um, JavaScript, but we do have tools that let you find problems in both. Um, so the energy profiler. This was showed in the keynote yesterday. We'll take a brief look at it. And I call out that Pratap Lakshman, who was the program manager that for the team that built this tools, is doing a talk tomorrow focused on performance tools for XAML applications. But he's going to really drill in and dive deep on this. So if you're interested in this, it may be worth attending that talk or certainly going and watching the portion of the talk uh, once it's put up online um, where he's going to really dig into this. But the Energy Profiler tool estimates power consumption due to three key pieces of an application, uh, CPU, network, and display. And so they try to estimate, um, you know, draw you a power chart that was showed in the keynote yesterday. We'll look at it a little bit more right now if people are interested. So once again, performance and diagnostics. Find all your tools from a single place. Energy consumption. Go ahead and click Start. It's going to launch my application. Let's use it for a little bit. Go ahead and click Stop. It will generate my report for me. And so when this pops up, it's going to show me a graph over time estimating my CPU consumption, my total power consumption, and my display. The reason the display is gray, sorry if it's hard to see, is when they were building the tool, the assumption was that there's not a lot you can do about controlling the display. It may be interested to know that it's using power. but So CPU and, in this case, and network. Remember I mentioned we had that bug earlier where my network connection wasn't working, so I don't have any network use going here. But I get this nice donut chart that tells me that the session consumed you know, 29 milliwatts of battery charge. And at this rate of usage, it would drain a fully charged standard battery in about six and a half hours. So that's pretty cool information to have. And then I can zoom in on various spikes if I want. And it'll recalculate. And so notice where I'm zooming in on my spikes. These are where I was navigating. If we think back to the UI responsiveness tool, where I was doing my image scaling when I was bringing up that, that big page, um, and so I might be able to improve the battery use of my application if I fix that image scaling issue as well. So hopefully, while we don't have the ability to combine the tools yet today, you can see how the tools work together in a complementary fashion, where the UI responsiveness tool points to you're doing a bunch of GCs, the memory tool helps me identify what's in memory, and then the power tool will help you identify you know, where are you using things like the CPU that could be affecting power, and then you drill in with the other tools. So, um. awesome. 
So the last thing I just want to briefly show, I'm not going to show, but it's just a brief review. Uh, debugging suspend and resume. Is everybody doing store application development remember how to debug suspend and resume? So on the, when you're in debug mode, uh, there's a debug location toolbar with a little suspend drop down up there. And that lets you choose to suspend, resume, suspend, and shut down. And that will invoke your code so you can set a breakpoint in that, those pieces of code and then hit that if you need to debug that particular logic because obviously that's not logic that you can just manually invoke while you're debugging by using the application. So background tasks and contracts, these are again code that may not be invocable through normal use of the application. So if your background task is meant to run when your application's not running or you have a search contract that you're having a problem with when your application's not running, under the debug property pages where we change the debugger type, there's a drop down higher up that says launch application. Uh, if you set that to no, when you press F5, your application will be in a state where it is being debugged, but it's not running. And so then if you go, for example, invoke, invoke the search contract, or you can once again use the debug location uh, launch bar, as I have a screenshot up here, to um, invoke any background tasks that are in your application. That sample JavaScript background task is my bottom thing there. So resources that I mentioned uh, previously, we have a diagnostics team blog. We try to produce blog entries about all of the features that we produce. So you should be able to use that for a lot more resources. We have a forum on MSDN if you have specific questions that you need to ask. And there's a couple related talks. Um, there was one earlier today that you may be interested in going back and watching if you didn't attend. It was new Internet Explorer developer tools. Um, I mentioned the parallel talk at the beginning that Andy Sterland was doing about inspecting and debugging using F12 in Internet Explorer. Um, and then the one tomorrow morning where he's going to really dig in on the UI responsiveness tool and the memory tool is the developing high performance websites and modern apps. And then finally, the XAML based talk is tomorrow at 10.30 and that's where I mentioned he'll really, really deep dive on the energy profiler. And does anybody here do XAML development as well as JavaScript and HTML? Okay, some people, so that might be an interesting one as well. Uh, Car Carl Melder is going to stand up and raise his hand. He's one of our UX researchers at Microsoft. We'd love to get your feedback if you want to talk to him. He's sitting in a conference room, 254, um, all day tomorrow, I think, till the conference ends. And if you just have anything that you want to stop by and tell us about how we can make Visual Studio better or what you want to see in Visual Studio, we'd love to get your feedback. Also, one of the things we're really interested in is what experience would you like around file management for the assets that are produced by the performance and diagnostics hub. So if you notice when I finish that energy profiling session or the UI responsiveness profiling session, I have a file. In preview, it's going to ask you every time you close it if you want to save. Carl would love to get your feedback right after this talk if you have a couple minutes just to say, hey, like I wish it was always saved for me. No, I think it's great that I can choose whether to keep it or throw it away. So. Um, Evaluate this session and question. So the question was, have you done any comparison between the various languages for battery consumption and CPU? Um, I know Windows has done some research there. I don't have a lot of insight into it. I know in general the guidance is, is there's not going to be a significant difference, but C++ will give you the potential best battery life because you aren't using a garbage collector. So in JavaScript or .NET, you do obviously have to use a little bit of extra CPU to run that garbage collection as opposed to managing that yourself. So nothing's completely free. Any additional questions? All right, well, I think the talk is over. Thank you very much.